Sometime in the 1530s, a Catholic Frenchman by the name of John Calvin was walking in the streets of Paris when he was pulled aside by an intimidating man. As Calvin was fearful, the man leaned in and asked, Young man, have you heard of God's free gift? Calvin squirmed and fled from the man. He was clearly one of those gospelers who started to follow the teachings of Martin Luther. And as Calvin wrote to his cousin Peter Robert, he started to realize that his cousin too was also becoming one of these Lutheran gospelers. And ever the good Catholic, Calvin wondered what he should do. He wanted to protect his cousin from being burned for heresy, yet at the same time he wanted to do the right thing, and that would involve being a good Catholic and turning his cousin into the authorities. As he wandered the streets, funnily enough, he could actually see the church burning a heretic at that exact point. And so wanting to get closer to the action, he walked towards the burning. And as he walked closer, he could hear the heretic sing Martin Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress Is Our God. And as he walked through the crowd to witness the event, he was met with utter surprise. The man who was singing while being burned was the same man who had encountered him on the street. Hello there. Okay, so obviously as the name suggests, today we're looking at the impact that John Calvin had on the Reformation. And so Calvin was a Frenchman who was studying to be a priest, of the Catholic Church that is, but then his dad changed the priesthood for law because law was more profitable. It was kind of the exact opposite of what Martin Luther did in our very first video of the series, which you can see here. But as part of his studies, Calvin took part in what we call the Renaissance Humanism Movement. Basically, if you know nothing about this, Renaissance Humanism was all about rediscovering classical works from ancient Greece and from ancient Rome. And so to be a good humanist, you have to know the languages that they were written in, and so Calvin became very skilled in ancient Greek, a skill that would be very useful later in his life. Now, it's important to note that during the early 1530s, the Lutheran movement had been going for about 15 years, but Calvin utterly hated Lutheranism, mainly because he was raised to view it as heresy. But at some point between 1529 and 1533, John Calvin was so moved by what his cousin Peter was saying, and by the death of the man that approached him on the street, that he actually became a Protestant. To put it in his own words, God by a sudden conversion subdued and brought his mind to a teachable frame. Just like the man we saw at the beginning, this made Calvin an official outlaw in France, and in 1534, he dressed up as a peasant worker and escaped to Basel. Now, while still on the run two years later, he wrote the first edition of his most famous work, the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Basically, this first edition of the book was the letter written to the Catholic King of France, Francis I, that provided a defense of Protestantism. His ultimate aim was to convert the king to Protestantism and then to move back to France. And though it didn't convert the king, many across Europe read the book and they were really moved by the book themselves. And so, unable to convert the king, Calvin decided that he would head to Strasbourg, which was a Protestant part of the Holy Roman Empire, and there he'd continue his writing. But as Calvin was journeying to Strasbourg, he stopped in Geneva to see his old friend, William Farrell. Now, it's really important to note that this guy was one of the most fiery Protestants of the Reformation, and he was known for doing things his way or the highway. In fact, as a little side story, later on when he was in his late 60s, he actually married a teenage girl. And when Calvin said to Farrell, hey, maybe this isn't a great look for Protestantism, it allows the Catholics to accuse us of being all about sex, Farrell simply ignored the warning and married the girl anyway. But back at Geneva, William Farrell was the chief Protestant pastor there, and Geneva was an absolute mess. You see, there was a group there called the Libertines who had a really distorted understanding of the Reformation, and they took Luther's teaching of being saved by grace alone to the absolute extreme. Basically, they believed that because works had no role in saving someone from their sin, then there was actually no need for Christians to do good works. And they would engage in all sorts of drunken debauchery to show how good God's grace is. And so from Farrell's point of view, his city was a mess, but then his superstar writer friend John Calvin had just showed up. And so Farrell put intense pressure on Calvin to stay there and to be a pastor in Geneva. Now, Calvin really didn't want to stay. Instead, he actually wanted to write quietly in Strasbourg, but Farrell said to him, God will curse your peace if you do not help in such a great time of need. And so under the intense pressure, Calvin stayed and pastored for three years, but unfortunately it was just too tough to minister to the Libertines, and in 1538 they actually ran both Calvin and Farrell out of town. So Calvin then went to Strasbourg and he published a second edition of his Institutes, but this was a much more comprehensive edition. It was basically what we call a systematic theology of the Bible, which is a commentary of the Bible ordered by topic. And this edition was particularly significant because it addressed the topic of double predestination. Basically, according to Calvin, if you read the ninth chapter of Romans where Paul talks about God loving Jacob but hating Esau, he would argue that it seemed to suggest that the Bible says that God has elected some to be saved, but also elected some to be damned. And so then, unlike the Catholic Church's teaching, Calvin argued that people do not in fact choose to have faith in God, 
but rather God softens their heart to have faith. So God elects people to become Christians rather than people choosing to trust God out of their own free will. Now, in Calvin's absence, Geneva was actually getting even worse and church attendance was really struggling. The Catholic Church actually asked if they wanted to rejoin, but there wasn't really anyone qualified enough in Geneva to make that call. So the Geneva Council went to find Calvin to ask him to come back, and Calvin actually wrote, Rather would I submit to death a hundred times than to that cross in which I had to perish daily a thousand times over. He hated his time in Geneva, but he also had a deep sense of duty and decided to return to help fix some of those issues in Geneva. And so Calvin returned to Geneva and actually married a woman in 1541 named Idolette, effectively raising the middle finger to the Roman Catholic idea that the clergy weren't supposed to marry. And during his second stint in Geneva, he preached over 2,000 sermons, and these were intense sermons. I'm talking one hour plus with no notes at all. With Martin Luther's death in 1546, Calvin also became the prominent voice for Protestantism, and we also saw the split between the Lutheran and Reformed traditions. It started with Zwingli and Luther unable to agree on the Lord's Supper, but continued with Calvin's insistence on double predestination, whereas Luther's successor, Philip Melanchthon, actually remained pretty silent on the topic. And as Calvin preached in Geneva, there still remained a handful of powerful libertine families that caused him stress. In 1553, Calvin actually asked the council, which consisted of many libertines, to resign, but they refused because they knew his dismissal would annoy the city too much. Finally, we finish today by looking at John Calvin's most scandalous hour, the death of this guy, Michael Savitas. Now, Savitas was a strange character. He was an incredibly intelligent doctor and was actually the first European to correctly explain the circulatory system, but his views on Christianity were an issue in medieval Europe because he denied the Christian teaching of the Trinity of God being Father, Son, and Spirit. The Trinity was also actually something that Protestants and Catholics both agreed on. And so throughout the 1540s, he sent 30 letters to Calvin mocking him for his beliefs in the Trinity, but after the first few, Calvin simply stopped responding. And because this made Savitas a heretic in every single European country, he adopted the pseudonym Michael Villanueva and went into hiding to avoid being arrested. But here's where the story gets really strange. Savitas actually showed up in Geneva to watch John Calvin preach at church in 1553. Now, Calvin was really confused, but the authorities decided to arrest Savitas straight away because he was an outlaw heretic all across Europe. And so if the government was going to execute Savitas for his heresy, as was custom in the 1500s, they needed to prove that he was a heretic, and so the Genevan government tasked John Calvin with the prosecution of the case. Now, Calvin was actually too ill to appear in person, and so he authored a case that was prosecuted by Nicholas de la Fontaine, and they easily got Savitas to admit that he denied the Trinity. Even the Libertine supported his execution. And so the night before he was executed, Calvin tried to talk Savitas out of it, but Savitas remained adamant that there was no Trinity, and then the Genevan government executed him. Now, Calvin certainly could have done more to stop the death of Savitas, but it is important to remember the context. Burning heretics was just common practice for the 1500s, and every government across Europe favoured the execution of Savitas, even the Catholic governments too. Now, Calvin himself died in 1564, but he died leaving a huge legacy. You see, Luther might have started the Reformation, but his beliefs weren't clearly scaffolded and set out. Calvin systematised the Protestant faith, and his commentary on the Bible is still widely considered the gold standard of biblical commentary in Protestant circles today. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss a video in the future and so that you become an expert in the Reformation. And we can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.